Mr. President. Senator from Wyoming. Mr. President, I appreciate the comments of the person that preceded me. Uh, we are heading into a territory where we've never been before. And in Washington, you get to get your Sunday funnies on Saturday. And so I took a little peek at Dilbert today, and I hope everybody will look at that because it, it emphasizes the problem. It, Dilbert says, I'm preparing for the complete meltdown of our financial system. I've got six months of food and water. I've got batteries and flashlights and gold coins. And the lady with the triangular hair says, I'm prepared too. I have your home address. And I noticed that your, pre your preparations are light on defensive weaponry. And she says, could you add some protein bars to the shopping list? And I want to share with you a, a letter from a 10-year-old in Wyoming that uh, made our statewide newspaper. He says, what does the government think of me? I think they think I'm not smart because I'm too young to know what they're doing, like raising the national debt. Don't they know I owe the country about $45,000? I'm only 10 years old. I could buy a lot with $45,000. That's more than my dad earns. But it wouldn't buy everything. Government shouldn't try to buy everything. It is my job and the people's job to buy things we need. I don't want the government to think for me. They don't know I'm a little brother who doesn't like it when my big brothers tell me what to do because they aren't always responsible for their own things. I don't tell my brothers what to do with their money. I'm smarter than they think I am. They should follow the rules. I'd ask that the entire letter be printed at the completion of my speech. And I, I thank Eric Mitchell of Crowhart, Wyoming, for his sage advice. It is disappointing to be here today, addressing the United States Senate on a topic that we should have dealt with months ago. Our country is in a financial crisis. Erskine Bowles, the co-chairman of the Deficit Commission, coined the situation we face as, quote, the most predictable economic crisis in history, end quote. And yet, there is no clear path forward to deal with both the short-term need to raise the debt limit and the long-term need to get spending under control. I'm disappointed we have made this discussion about the debt ceiling instead of our ever-increasing spending. When you spend beyond your means, you have to cut back. That's what the 10-year-old said. The plans we are considering at this stage in the debate are plans for the next two years. While there is merit making the spending cuts these bills make, they are not the ultimate solution. We need more significant action. We need to move forward with something bold. My Republican colleagues and I have proposed such plans. I have proposed a solution that would cut just one penny from every dollar we spend for six years and then cap the spending at the historical amount of revenue that we take in during the seventh year. In the eighth year, we would have a balanced budget. Unfortunately, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle refuse to even debate measures like my penny plan or the cut cap and balance act or even the plan put forward by Speaker Boehner. At the same time, they refuse to debate these measures. They refuse to put forward their own plan for long-term structural changes. They're only willing to debate plans that make changes in the short term, and so we're stuck here on a weekend debating a plan that's deeply flawed. I think it's important to look at where the debate is today versus where it was when President Obama was sworn in. It's clear that we've come a long way from where we were when President Obama took office. In 2009, Democrats in Congress passed a so-called economic stimulus bill that cost a trillion dollars. To pay for it, we borrowed that money. And as the unemployment numbers prove, all that borrowing didn't solve our economic problems. Apparently, we spent over $275,000 per job. And none of those employees got paid that well. In 2010, President Obama's second year in office, Democrats in Congress forced through an unpopular health care bill, which was wrought with budget gimmicks and will ultimately cost our country trillions of dollars. The president's attempt at health care reform was so unsuccessful that the largest problem facing our debt and deficit situation is what we will do to contain health care costs. Another trillion dollars borrowed. Another trillion dollars wasted. The American people were fed up with congressional Democrats' reckless spending spree, and in November 2010, they voted for real change. Those votes ushered in a new attitude. 
and seven months into a Republican-controlled House of Representatives, the debate is entirely different. Instead of looking at where we can spend money, we're looking for where we can cut. Instead of looking at how to borrow more money, we're looking at how we can change our spending habits so that we have a spending plan that will work in the future. Republicans have heard the people's call for smaller government and less spending and are committed to taking action. Either this year, earlier this year, Republicans led efforts to cut spending and appropriations bills for the first time in years. Now we need to find a solution to cut trillions of dollars in spending at the same time that we allow the president to have some additional borrowing authority to pay for the purchases we've already made. The cuts Republicans have proposed are the largest cuts ever seen, but it still isn't enough to fix the problem long term. Why aren't we looking at a long-term solution to this problem? Why are we forced to look at short-term piddly spending cuts at the same time we give the president the ability to borrow lots more money? This isn't one person or one party's fault. The president does have us in a box. During his State of the Union message, the president could have explained to the American people the dire situation we're facing. The Deficit Commission had already painted the picture. The president needed to premiere that picture. He could have explained that we're borrowing more than 40 cents of every dollar that we spend, much of it from China. He could have explained that we are on a spending spree that must be stopped. That was and is the true State of the Union. After the State of the Union, he could have sent us a serious budget model after his own deficit commission. Instead, he used the State of the Union to talk about more spending, and his budget was a ridiculous proposal, so ridiculous it didn't receive a single, re single vote, Republican or Democratic, when it was put before the Senate. Let me repeat that. His State of the Union about spending and his budget was such a ridiculous proposal it didn't receive a single vote, not a Republican vote or a Democratic vote, when it was put before the Senate. While the Senate has failed to lead and deserves a substantial portion of the blame, we in Congress have also put ourselves in this box. During the last administration, we should have worked to contain, contain spending. While we missed that opportunity, when it was clear that we needed to make a major change this year, Democrats in the Senate should have ignored the President's lack of leadership and put forth a budget proposal in the Senate. The House passed a budget, but rather than taking their proposal seriously, my Democratic colleagues demonized the plan as the end of Medicare. They preferred finding a campaign issue as opposed to actually solving the financial problems we face. Unfortunately, we're quickly running out of options. We are at a catch-22. The country can't afford more debt, but has to have it. If we don't raise the debt ceiling, we won't be able to pay all our bills and the interest rates will go up. On the other hand, if we pass a plan, plan that doesn't fundamentally change the way we do business in Washington, we increase the debt limit with no end in sight, and interest rates go up. The majority in the Senate that brought you banking reform has run up a huge debt, and we've all maxed out the nation's credit cards. Now they want to increase the amount of the mortgage. Imagine trying to get a loan when nothing has been paid on the principal of the previous loan for years. Now imagine the lender's reaction when he's told that the mortgagee will be back shortly for another loan. Let me put this in concrete terms because it might be easier to understand. I'm trying to keep these numbers proportional to the $14 trillion debt. Imagine that you have a loan on a very large house with a mortgage of $1.4 million. Since buying the house, you have made interest payments, but not a single payment on the principal. You determine you need more money to spend, so you go to the lender and you request an additional loan of $230,000. At the same time you do that, you are honest and warn the lender that you'll be back next year and for the next nine years asking for $100,000 more each year. You also let the lender know that you don't want to have to pay off any of the principal on the loan, just make interest payments each year. I don't think any lender would take you seriously, but if he or she did, they would explain that you would have to obtain a variable rate loan. A variable rate loan means that the changes in risk to the economy could drive interest rates much higher, and there'd be no protection from these higher interest rates. 
In other words, your loan with an excellent interest rate of 2.5% could go to an interest rate of 5% or 10% or like under President Carter, over 18% a year. A 1% increase in the interest rate for the U.S. debt would cost another one and three tenths trillion dollars over 10 years. That's just a 1% raise. The lender would point out that the raise in debt plus the rise in interest rates could result in your entire paycheck going to interest. And the interest payments would have to come ahead of food, clothing, and any social needs for you or your children or your parents or your grandparents. That's what we're talking about here as a potential future for the United States. The entire interest payments going to pay, be the only thing that we can pay for. Now, if the banker were foolish enough to consider such a loan, he'd want to know what spending changes you were going to make. He would expect changes immediately, not piddly changes, this year for a promise of a big change in the ninth year. He would want some proof that you were serious. If we act now and agree to cut 1%, the 1% solution, just one penny of each dollar from our spending and reduce the cap to the new spending level by that year for each of the next seven years, the lender might consider your loan serious. There's a good chance he would expect 2 or 3% in cuts for the first year to demonstrate you're serious about kicking your spending habit. We are in that situation today in Congress. The president is asking for a two and four tenths trillion dollar loan increase, the largest loan increase in our nation's history. Our lenders will explain to us if we were worried about the low income, the downtrodden, and the less fortunate today, we should see what will happen to those individuals if we don't cut spending. If we reach a situation where all our revenues are going to interest payments on the debt, the future prioritization to pay for our debt will be unbearable. We can't go out 18 months. The American people don't trust us. We need to be accountable to the people. We need an enforceable, accountable plan with quicker results. Some might argue that the lender would just expect you to bring in more money. Well, my Democratic colleagues suggest just that when they say we must raise taxes. But everyone knows that if you ask your boss for a raise because you can't control your spending, you could be fired or demoted, and as a result, you would bring in less revenue. I don't need to tell you that our bosses, the American people, don't think much of how we've been working for them, and they don't expect a tax increase every time Washington, Washington gets addicted to giving away money. The plan the majority leader has offered uses budget gimmicks to avoid real spending cuts and gives the president a debt limit increase that, while politically expedient, fails to put our country on a workable path. It doesn't provide a way to assure any substantial cuts will be made. While it maybe makes some necessary spending cuts today, it does not provide us with relief from our long-term challenges and does not put us in a situation where we would be forced to make tough choices. We know that the majority leader's proposal won't pass. Every Republican has made clear that they will oppose the proposal, and so it doesn't have a chance to move forward. We have made clear that we will not give the president the largest single debt ceiling increase in history for double the average time generally allowed since 1940 through the proposal the majority leader has offered. We've offered to vote on this proposal time and time again, and for reasons beyond comprehension, he refuses to allow a vote. He did a vote within 30 minutes of the time that the House bill came over here, but he wants to drag out the vote on his bill. I know that that's delay to bring the pressure to the last minute, but that isn't how reasonable government works. I wish we had taken action earlier to avoid the situation we find ourselves in today. I wish the proposal before us was a serious effort to make structural change to how we spend money. Instead, we all know the plan put forward by the majority leader will be voted down later tonight or tomorrow and will be in the same place we are right now, in the box where we need to raise the debt limit, but we also need to make structural changes to get our fiscal house in order to keep the markets from melting down. We do recognize we're about to enter territory where our country has never been. The stock markets are already reacting. Because we are debating short-term solutions, this debate will continue on even after we act on the debt ceiling. I hope we can come together on a debt ceiling increase and a plan for real spending cuts. That's where the emphasis needs to be, and it has to have enforcement. I hope the debt ceiling is limited to the amount of guaranteed cuts. I hope we can put our country back on a sustainable fiscal path. I yield the floor.